Okay. Ever one of those days where you feel like you're moving in slow motion? Oh my god, this is my second video tonight. It is really dark outside, and that stupid asshole is still outside mowing his grass. It's not dark or dusky, it's dark! And the guy's still mowing his grass. <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> Who mows their grass in total darkness? I want to know that. I want to know. It's totally dark outside. I think I'm going to mow the yard. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> Speaking of stupid humans. Um, <laughs> attribute reification and absence reification. All of the things that you take for granted because you grew up hearing these words, like illumination, right? Sure, everybody knows what illumination is, right? Uh, yeah, you sure about that? It's attribute reification. There's no such thing as illumination. Let's actually define that here very quickly. Space, time, waves. Waves is not a thing. There's no such thing as a wave. A wave is said of something else in activity. Uh, you ever want to confuse a scientist, and by scientist I mean idiot mathematician with a PhD hanging on the wall wearing a white lab coat that's not really that smart? who believes in the cult of bumping particles, uh, CBPs, I call it. Ask them, uh, ask them to define the term energy or wave. They'll, they'll never be able to do it. Um, energy also, too, is uh, that's uh, referring to specifically an ether perturbation modality or an ether modality of perturbation. We're referring to dielectricity, electricity, or gravity, or electrostatics, for example. Attribute reification, emptiness and shadows. Um, there's actually an ancient Indian school called the Shunyavada school, which literally means the emptiness, emptiness-ism school. Of course, there's no such thing as emptiness. Emptiness is said of something else, I mean. Like, uh, Alaska is empty of elephants. Alaska is empty of palm trees, for example. Saying the absence of something relative to something else is not the substantialization of the complete and total absence of that. This is how one religion actually got completely and entirely screwed up from top to bottom and left to right. I translate ancient Pali, for example, and this term anatta occurs contextually um, 442 times and it has 22 variants and I know each and every occurrence. Uh, all modern Buddhism uh, unfortunately believes that the uh, that uh, Buddhism taught that there was no soul, and there's absolutely not a single doctrinal passage in the Pali Nikayas, for example, Diga Nikaya, Majima, Samyuda, and Gotaro, Kudaku Nikaya, including the Udana, Iriwotaka, the Sudanapara, on and on and on. If I said that A, B, C, D are not X, would you therefore conclude that therefore I am stating that there's no such thing as X? Of course that's not the case. If I said that there was no signal in a radio, would you therefore assume that I am postulating the belief that there's no such thing as a radio signal? Well, of course not. It means that a tuned signal is consubstantial to the radio. Now, the radio is tuning a signal. There's no more a signal in the radio than there is a soul in the body. Now, if I were to make the, uh, the substantial and accurate statement that the psychophysical or the corporeal does not have a soul, i.e., the body does not have a soul, of course, that's a double issue there since have implies possession. Nothing has a soul. And that is not a denial of the soul. But it also is not a denial of the soul to say that there is no soul in the body. Someone talks about, you know, is there a soul in the body? And of course there's not a soul in the body. There's consubstantiality between the two, just as in the case of the radio signal and the radio. But that is not a denial of the soul. What it is is called finer nuance. This, of course, is the consubstantiality spoken of. To make a more simple analogy, for example, we're talking about consubstantiality and identification phenomenology of monism, for example. Most people don't know what Pythagorean and Platonic monism is. That's okay. What happens, for example, when you shine a white light, like a light bulb, onto a red wall? What happens to the reflected light that comes back to your eyes? It's red light, right? You shine a white light in a blue wall, what happens? You see blue light reflected off that blue wall, right? So the white light takes upon itself the attribute, i.e. becomes consubstantial to the blue wall. Therefore, the reflected light is blue. Now, the premise of the true liberation and transcendence methodology of monism, both Greek, Indian, and Platonic, 
is the synthesis or theurgy that one uh, has a point source uh, non-consubstantiality which that they become in con they, that which they come in contact with and to use the same light analogy let's say we take a red laser and we shine it on that blue wall for example what happens what comes back to your eye off of that blue wall from the red laser light it's still red laser light what happens when you shine a red laser onto a green wall you still see the red laser, right? Because the light itself, which is point source, people say coherent, but coherent is only a posterior attribute of saying it's a point source light. What actually defines laser light is that it's a point source emission. The laser light does not take upon itself any attribution or consubstantiality with the coincidence of that blue wall or that green wall or yellow wall or whatever. The same difference when we're talking about light as far as a transcendence or, or equatable, it's the same thing that actually defines uh, a magnet versus a pre-magnet, because magnet is only said of uh, it is not uh, it is not of the uh, quantitative nature that defines a magnet, but the qualitative. Before a magnet becomes a magnet, it's exactly the same uh, quantitative neodymium, iron, boron, ceramic mass that's been nickel plated. The only thing that defines the magnet is the uh, is the attribute of its uh, qualitative state, where it is a point source, uh, coherent field um, of uh, the entire molecular structure of the neodymium, iron, boron, crystalline lattice that makes up the very thing that fascinates people, i.e. the magnetic field around a magnet. But the field around a magnet is, of course, not being emitted by the magnet. It is the nature of the ether perturbation that is due to the point source nature of the magnet. But in speaking about absence, reification, emptiness, and shadow, of course, there's no such thing as emptiness. Something is empty of something else. Subject precedes object of negation. If you've ever, you should always ask, for example, uh, some of these idiots that believe in emptiness as liberation and say, well, I experienced emptiness. It's like, well, who experienced it? Well, I did. Well, if you did, then it wasn't empty because you were in it and you experienced it. And <laughs> Shadows. A shadow is not a thing. A shadow is uh, attribute, or excuse me, uh, absence reification, and speaking of the absence of light. But we actually have all these pathetic little conceptual English or whatever language you're born into, words hanging in our head. We actually think these are things. There's no such thing as uh, space having properties. This was famously said by Nikola Tesla. It has attributes, just like a shadow. If you stand in a shadow, you feel colder, right? Because the light's not falling on you, falling on you, like sunlight, for example. But that doesn't mean that you could actually substantialize the absence of light, i.e. a shadow. A shadow is not a thing. A shadow is said of the absence of light. There's no such thing as a shadow, just as there's no such thing as a wave. Space has absolutely no properties. However, Every branch, when you deny the ether, then you have to substantialize things like particles and space and time. You and I all grew up with the same bullshit. Talk about every science fiction show you've ever watched and I've ever watched. Curved space-time, warped space-time. Time is only a measure of magnitudes. There's no such thing as an entity called time. Time does not exist as an entity. It is neither physical nor is it metaphysical. It does not exist. It is a measure. If someone were to reify time as being something that is no different than someone trying to reify a measure on a ruler as something. Oh, over there I see two inches. Two inches of what? Two inches is over there. I see it walking. What are you talking about? Two inches is a measure. No, no, no. Look over there. There's, there's two inches right over there. There's no difference between saying two inches or five feet or and saying time. Time has absolutely, by the way, it would take a long time to explain this, but every branch of metaphysics has always said that four is equatable to time. It has to do with point, line, circle, sphere. Um, also, too, the uh, first five numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, which are one, one, two, three, and five, does not contain the number four. Four has always been, it would take a long time to explain this, trust me. Four has always been the number for time, or chronos, and time does not exist in the Fibonacci sequence. One, one, two, three, five. Four doesn't exist in there. That would take a long time to explain. Space has absolutely no properties. It has attributes, but it doesn't have any properties. There's no such thing as a wave. I've actually made several videos on illumination. Illumination is another attribute reification. That's like saying we can only define light by what it does. People actually uh, 
conceptualize light and illumination as one and the same thing. We talk about illumination, we're speaking about light, we speak about light, we're speaking about illumination. And this, of course, becomes a circular paradox ad infinitum that becomes ultimately self-defeating since there's no such thing as identified light outside of its attribute. In other words, the principle and the attribute one and the same thing. You can't eliminate out light without having illumination and vice versa is also impossible. As is the case with energy. E energy is actually a concept reification. I mean, ask a scientist to define what energy is. Um, getting back to the term anatta, the entire religion of Buddhism, uh, currently, not originally, I believes that, the, that there's no such thing as a soul. And it's ridiculous. I, I've counted over 2,000 passages where the Atman is, i.e. the soul. Atman is a Pali term for Atman in Sanskrit, where the soul is lauded, lauded it as, uh, lauded, excuse me, did I say lauded it? As uh, lauded as the uh, charioteer Atta Vasarati. Um, the self and the self, i.e. the psychophysical self and the ontological self, are always differentiated out in Greek and Indian metaphysics. But modern Buddhists are so insanely unintelligent that they actually can't see the forest for the trees. There's not a single doctrinal passage in all religious debate is sola scriptura. It's like, we're going to debate a religion? You know, doctrine could be BS, right? There's plenty of religious doctrine which is absolute insane BS, but if we're going to debate it, it has to be specifically sola, sola scriptura, which means based in the doctrine. In other words, my beliefs and your beliefs, if we we're debating a specific topic, in Buddhism, for example, which I'm an expert on, literally, I've debated the best minds in the world on that topic, and by best, I mean relatively best, and uh, destroyed them on that topic. There's not a single passage which advocates for the non-existence of the soul. In fact, the soul is uh, the light, atta vahatsarati, atta dipa, um, what am I speaking ancient Pali? Nobody here knows what the hell I'm saying. Um, but anyway, there's this term, and it's a via negativa apophatic method is, uh, methodology, which refers to objective negation to arrive at subjective synthesis. This neti neti via negativa. And uh, so the term anatta exists, or in Sanskrit, the term is anatman. Interestingly enough, the Advaita Vedantists actually use the term anatman also, but... Those people never got to the point, these many, uh, these many hundreds and thousands of years later, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of years later, to uh, confuse the term anatman with rejection of uh, the atman or the soul. But Buddhists, however, are, are completely mentally defunct, right off their rockers, insane. There's nowhere a denial in doctrine of the atman. Absolutely nowhere. It's ludicrous. Uh, I spent 15 years debating these people. I've destroyed every one of them. And by destroyed, I mean destroyed. Um, humanity, oddly enough, and you think I'm saying this like I'm boasting, which I guess I slightly am, but it actually shocks me that humanity is so insanely illogical that they actually can't see what it is that they, they uh, instantaneously... Uh, conceptualized in their mind because they spent so many years using a word, a word like space and time and waves and illumination and emptiness and shadows and they have no wherewithal to understand what these things mean like a point or a line or the word energy if you ever want to mind screw over a scientist ask them to define hey hey mr phd scientist in that white lab can define energy they can't do it Ask them to define a field. That will really screw them over. First thing they'll do is they'll try to give you one of the Maxwellian field equations. But that only defines a field with an effect over a period of time in a given vector. I said, no, 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 no. Define the word kora, that's the ancient Greek, i.e. field. Just define the word field in itself by itself. They can't do it. Everything is fields and fields are not particles. There is no branch of science, and by modern science I mean mathematicians. You can't quantify a field until it's done something. It's made an interaction and a net result measured in watts, volts, joules, yada yada. Yeah, we could define the field. Yeah, you could only define the field over here after an interaction has occurred with a net result. That still doesn't tell you what the hell this is over here, a field. What's a field at rest? Oh my god, that will really mind screw over a scientist. That's going to define any hey, scientist, define the word field. Oh my god.
You're going to see a guy that'll like uh, curl up into a ball and poop himself and then start drooling. They have no idea what terms like energy and field. They reify space and time. Space has no properties and time is only a measure. You can't warp space and time. That's like saying I'm warping two inches. Two inches of what? I'm warping it. You and I have all grown up with this bullshit in our movies and our TV shows. Warp space time! Everything is electrostatic and magnetic. People like to say everything's electrical, but I don't care what people say. It's electrical, electrostatic, and magnetic. Electricity is a hybrid of electric, uh, magnetism and dielectricity, but... These things are not bent. There's no such thing as bent space and time. Sure, we see light being bent around large gravitational masses through astronomical telescopes. So, so, well, yeah, that's electrostatic. Uh, yeah, because light is a coaxial circuit, transverse electrical magnetic longitudinal pulse. But yeah, light is being bent by a strong gravitational field. That's not in denial. That doesn't mean there's any such thing as warp space-time. Sure, this is the other one. This specifically is called an electrokinematic effect. Great relativity is proven. Space, space is. <laughs> this is how stupid these people are. Dr. Oleg D. Jefeminko, who had two PhDs, actually explained this away very, very easily ages ago. So did several other people. So relativity is proven because we actually have a time correction for our global positioning satellites. They're moving so fast around the Earth, we actually have to correct for their speed. And this, of course, backs up relativity. It does absolutely no such thing. What it actually backs up is that things under high speed undergo an electrokinematic effect. Specifically, it is a phase shift due to ultra high speed motion through the Earth's magnetosphere. They actually do have a time shift. So there is temporal correction for high speed global positioning satellites, but it has nothing to do with supporting relativity. Just the opposite, it actually has to do with the classical Faraday, Steinmetz, Tesla, Heaviside um, electrical theory. And by electrical theory, I mean dielectric and magnetic. Uh, people love to quote that too. Sheer relativity is proven due to GPS satellite current time correction. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because you just stuck your crotch in a bear trap. Now let me close it for you. <laughs> There's no such thing as warp space-time. This is ridiculous. Time is not a thing, and space has no properties. What the hell is it you're going to warp? Time is a measure of the movement of magnitudes. You can't warp time or space. This is ridiculous. Sure you can. No, you can't. Absolutely you cannot. You know, I'll start listening to you when you can define the word field and energy for me. Until then, everything is fields and fields are not particles. You know, until a real scientist... And it's okay not to know stuff. You know, I have a lot more respect for a scientist that will say, I don't know, than someone will say, Well, sure, man, it's written in uh, Richard Feynman's book in QED Strange Theory of Light and Matter that virtual quasi-particles are time-traveling... <laughs> These knuckle-dragging mental midget crayon eaters. Oh my god, it's the cult of bumping particles. But don't worry, they need your money to uh, keep funding the uh, CERN and the Large Hadron Particle Collider. If we keep bumping particles long enough, we're going to see the face of God. Just give us $5 billion more for 10 more years of funding so we can keep smashing atoms together. Eventually we're going to find it! <laughs> no, you're not.